Morning everyone, Jake Wolke here at Wolke Farm. Beautiful spring rain coming in yet again. What a season it's been. And we just bought six new old dairy cows. So here's the dairy cows that arrived yesterday. If you follow along, you'd recognize there's Jersey Girl and the Frisian. So she's got the twins. These are the house cows that we've been milking and their little calves. We picked up a few extra calves and we just got six new Jersey Frisian crosses, all from the same farm. So we've let them all in this yard together to calm down a bit they came in pretty calm dairy cows are used to lots of handling but we thought they'd enjoy seeing their friends but these cows are all retired and they were all destined for the abattoirs the industry calls dairy cows choppers they're big framed animals like the that big frisian there she would be like a 600 kilo animal they're they're, they're a big framed cow uh, and at the end of their milking life so if they get mastitis mastitis stays in the system and it, it, it recurs unless you get proper management so if they get mastitis if they have milk fever if their production drops uh, if they're getting old if they didn't get in calf and they were meant to all these things are reasons that farmers would sell these dairy cows off to the abattoirs and the abattoirs buy them cheap and they call them choppers and the price has fluctuated over the last couple of years anywhere from 500 bucks per head up to $1,000 per head. And if you compare that at a price per kilo rate compared to a beef cow, it's extremely cheap. You know, it's, sometimes it's less than a buck a kilo and your beef cows might be going for three bucks a kilo at the moment. So very cheap uh, price. Why is it so cheap? Well, the idea is here in Australia is that dairy cows meat's no good. And I'm probably one of the very fringe uh, <laughs> minorities that doesn't necessarily by that narrative you know a cow's a cow and our, our beef breeds put beef on quicker they're less bony and you know in a holistic management sense they have their benefits because they're they're lighter on foot theoretically if you're not getting them to full frame size so they're not going to compact your soil especially if you're using dexters or low lines but these have been bred for milk and see some still have milk in them they're just in the process of drying off and i just think it's an absolute shame that these choppers, as they're called in the industry, are going to be sent to the abs and turned into mints. The $6 a kilo mints you buy at the supermarket, this is what it is. And I think there's a better alternative. I don't know if you can see it on the video. Yeah, I think you can. See that green outline? There, yeah, that's where they've been strip grazing. They've been going across the last four days. And now the mob's right down here with the eggmobile following them down and they're about to leap into our westernmost paddock come up on the lush side of that fence around that dead tree but then they'll be rotating up here beautiful grass on the ground at the moment I've heard myself sniffling a lot in my videos when I edit it and it makes me cringe but guys I get really bad hay fever something I'm working on lots of diet changes and all sorts of things so I'm getting better trying to be mindful not to do it so here's the new ones they're all they're all pretty small our dairy cows actually they're pretty slight framed especially when you compare them to this Frisian look at how you probably can't reference but she would be a good foot taller than our fences and they're about the height of the fence hey darling when you start milking them by hand, they tame up so quick. So what are we doing with them and why are we doing it? We are grass finishing these in a relaxed, holistic environment with daily moves, ad lib access to all the minerals they might need. And when these girls come in, they hammer the minerals. They go after all sorts of different stuff, but they've got big, uh, big metabolisms, big big engines that they're fueling up and some of these most of these girls are eight years old there's a couple that are five but most are eight years old 
So there's, there'd barely be a farmer around, especially in a stocking sense. Breeders that have older cows, but in a stocker sense, that would have anything anywhere near that. But we're going to be grass finishing these for a minimum of about four months. So I've got, uh, we've got cows down in the mob that have already had seven or eight months on them to finish. So we're going to test them. And what we're going to do is process them, hang them, you know, for anywhere from two to six weeks just to see where the soft spot is because it is an older muscle and it theoretically should be a little bit tougher. So a little bit of extra time hanging should pull that muscle into line. But guys, the way you get marbling in your meat and your really heavily marbled meats, they pump a lot of grain into it. Puts gets the animal to put fat on in their muscle um, and put muscle on quicker and fat on quicker, that real clear stuff. You can get marbling without grain, but it comes with age. These guys have the age. Uh, people that have had uh, grass-finished dairy, these have been fed some corn because they've come from a, you know, a dairy that I've got nothing to do with and they do get fed grain at corn. Uh, they do get fed grain at dairy farms. I uh, don't have control over that process, but uh, I'm just happy that they, that they sell these to me. But we're going to finish them off and people that have eaten dairy, old dairy... It's got a real thick yellow fat, like a real yellow, yellow fat instead of this, like our stuff's got a yellow tinge to it because it's grass fed. It's a lot darker than the supermarket stuff, but it's nothing compared to what these girls will have. It's, apparently it's, it tastes like cheese, got cheesy notes, thick, heavy flavors, really full and bold. So I'm really excited about bringing this to the markets and I've been talking about it a little bit and I've actually got restaurants that have already got their names down. They want it. So there's a Charolais Cross Angus. We've got Frisian Anguses and Jersey Anguses here. There's my favourite Jersey girl. She's chilling. I'll show you the mob. We'll get up close. It'll be very interesting for everybody to take note about the condition of these. Like this one here. It's in fair, fair condition. See some of them, their ribs are actually, you know, not showing too much, but their hips are really sunken. But that's a dairy characteristic obviously but you can see some are obviously in a lot lesser condition than others due to their working life that one looks great already this one's got really sunken stomach you will be amazed how fat these get they're going to put on a lot of weight here really quickly yeah, some of you are still drying off your poor things that one's got five teats So I am hoping that we can get access to these dairy cows, finish them, process them, hang them, and sell them as a premium product. I don't want to put them next to beef breeds, and I don't want to sell them to people and not say what it is. I want to make a deal out of what it is and create a premium product around it, because I think it'll be there. You know, we're in a in a food system where everything's young. The reason that the system harvests animals when they harvest them is based on return. They've put the feed in, they've got them to the weight, and if they fatten them up any further or let them grow any further, the return starts diminishing. You know, they've, they've worked it out that you get a pig, you get a bacon at six or seven months, and if, if you get it to nine months, that extra three months worth of feed you've put in it won't pay for itself in increased yield. So consumers don't get the option of trying these um, products that in other parts of the world and all throughout history were staples. If you look at France, Italy, Spain, these countries eat dairy cows flat out and they're, they're delicacies. A lot of these areas don't even really have beef breeds. It's the old dairy cows and the old breeders that get put through the meat system. So I'm optimistic. Check out the orchard, it's cranking. Everything's flowering, leafing up. We've already had flowering actually. I'll show you the cherries are flowering now. We need to do a little bit of weeding, but not too much. Oh, that's a shame. That was in my orange tree. Obviously it's fallen out in a storm or, oh, my pockets are falling out. Or an animal's got it. That was right here. Yep, someone's ripped it out. What a shame. Here's our rows of potatoes. We just raked back the 
wood chips and dropped the spud in and raked it back over so it's just sitting on the surface level we've got multiple rows we've got about 20 kilos in you can see they're already fruiting here apricot tree we've got all sorts of different herbs and berries and things peppermints and the odd weed but there's an apple overall everything is fairly well organized this one here this is a nashi i don't really know if nashis are popular worldwide but that's an apple pear cross and they are delicious they are so juicy just yum so the incubator is holding everything well there's all the eggs from the 21st which was eight days ago so i'm going to candle them now and then dad put another batch of eggs in these are just eggs off the floor and that we couldn't sell anyway so we're going to turn them into little chicks so time to just get my this is just a very good quality bike torch actually oh look at that crazy and we're going to do some candling so what we do let me show you anyway come in and have a look what we do is we grab the egg we hit it with a light to see that dark mass that's got something growing in it so that can stay in and we need to go through and candle all of them see that one fertile you will get some eggs you'd like to pick back up you will get some eggs that just fully light up and the porch light just goes straight through them and then you've got an egg that wasn't fertile didn't succeed for any reason so they get turfed it's important to remove them because the um, the bacteria that starts forming as they start to rot and contaminate other eggs around them. So you want to pull them out. And also you need to know what you're dealing with. You need to know how many chicks have got on the way. Beautiful spring rain. We will take it. Alrighty guys, I am in my office now. Oh, I've got a little thing here. That's pretty cool. With my darling. Hey babe. We're in the bike shop at the moment, you can see the bike there, I've got a heap of book work to do. Just charging my laptop up, but I've got a few deliveries here off eBay that I wanted to show you. I am starting to get deep in my research of the Aussie landscape and reading Pat Colby's book, Natural Farming. She references this a couple of times, Diary of a Welsh, Welsh Swagman, and it was observations of William Evans during these years of the degradation that had happened to our landscape. So that'll be a super interesting one. Looks like a really nice book. And then here's another one that I just purchased. This was also recommended by Colby. In her book, Natural Farming, Recollections recollections of Squatting in Victoria. And it's got cool fold-out maps. And this is a earlier era. This is 41 to 51, which is just super interesting researching observations of our landscape. I think it is super important to do a little bit of research from writings as early as to understand what we're dealing with because the landscape that we are viewing now that we think we're doing well with could be so far off the mark of its potential um, that we're really maybe not investing all that we need to in restoration and listening um, and reading American authors although it's helpful and a lot of the practices are the same they have a very different climate our climate here is very brittle we have very thin, very old soil, whereas North America, when it was settled, there were some places they talk about having 30 feet of topsoil, you know, with prairies that had grass so um, high that the pioneers could tie it over the back of their um, horses while, while remaining saddled, like it, just a completely different landscape. And if you have read Charles Massey's Call of the Reed Warbler, he refers to some old um, diaries and journals like these where the early... Um, settlers on the soldier settlers blocks when they were taking on virgin land were having um, such great luck with their farms that they went in enormously big in the first three years and saw the eco collapse, ecosystems collapse in three years so they've gone from 
abundant pastures raising fat lambs to having the fields wash away and gullies appear in three years. I mean, this is hundreds of years ago, um, many, many decades. So super interesting to understand, I guess, a little bit more about our specific climate here. It's always really interesting to me that all the literature I consume from North America talks about how to handle their farm and manage their farm through a winter where they're under snow for three or four months. And then their summer is quite mild in a lot of North America. It's similar to our spring. Obviously, you've got Arizona and, you know, and, and um, you know, places down on the south that have a similar climate to us. But a lot of what we read is out of quite lush pasture. So I'm looking forward to getting these in. I think it's important to read some literature as close to home as possible to understand what you're really dealing with. Rightio, guys. guys, there she is. She is 90% done as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but we will hang a door on it at some stage. Just to give you a bit of a look at how she works. I've got to recenter that. I've got a little plan, but that'll come forward and be nice and neat. Do toilets, throw in your sawdust. Under this lid, we will have space for a spare bucket or two. And just goes in the compost heap when we're done. But I think that looks quite respectable.